What's up guys, it's your host Spartanic Arts DxD back with another high school DxD related video. And today we have What If Issei Was Abandoned, Part 18. If we could, let's try to hit a thousand likes again. And yes, I see everybody joining Limit Breaker and Balance Breaker. Thank you so much. That's absolutely amazing. Like I cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much. If you guys want to know exactly when I upload such my upload schedule, as I just mentioned, click the little blue button right next to the subscribe button. I will also link the join channel membership button is the first link in the description as well as posted in the premiere as you are seeing right now. Also, if you're present already, go ahead and hit that like button. All right. Thank you so much. And without further ado, I'm going to shout out my two other channels, which is Ampopowski and Fallen DxD that I'll be linked down in the description below as well as on the related channels. So go ahead and give them a good subscribe. Also, without further ado, let's go ahead and thank my balance breakers. Rob the King, Lachlan Yates, Atomic Warlord 58, Seth Foyles, Ant Lewis, The Beast YT3, Colax, Joe Baldwin, Russell Getchell Jr., Madara Uchiha, Reefik 135, Keep Saying 21, Blue Lightning, Sinrar Q, X Data Patty Gaming, Viewer with Hashtag 2347, Sanitates, Steven Cruz, Zkiki 2000, The J Boys, The PS underscore Gamer, just kidding, The PS Gamer, I did that to mess with you this time, Xor X108, Jordan Pachow, Maza. Dr. Underscore MLG Underscore is the bomb. Asimotus, Grim Fireshot Gamer, That Round Guy, Zero Fusion, Source Sponder, Nick May 98, God Said Why, and Chaotic Raven. Thank you so much for becoming a balance breaker. And without further ado, my bad, which is the highest cha man channel membership. <laughs> Sorry, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get into part 18. We are right on chapter 9 where he's talking about the Persian Gulf. After that, we will arrive in Iran, and although having a bad reputation, it is quite beautiful and has pretty much every biome known by mankind, whether deserts, jungles, cold mountains, tropical forests, and others. He sounded like a vacation advertisement on TV. Fugi was excited, she agreed, completely nodding her head in the continuation. Erica was without words, but she decided to leave her shock behind. So she slumped her shoulders and gave up. With you, I will certainly not get bored. She then recovered and walked towards the boat, Fuki right behind her. Issa was standing there, looking at his own boat, a sense of pride and accomplishment filled him. Time to go, he then walked up towards his boat and climbed upwards. Once up, he saw that the women were either at the side of the hall. Looking at the Persian Gulf, they will now sail in. Issei went towards the steering wheel and turned on the boat, however, he forgot about something. How the hell do you drive this thing, Issei thought as he looked on the controls above. Let me help. The voice of the dragon was heard inside of his head. You know how to sail a boat? He was surprised at his words. Yes, the past possessor was an extremely good pirate, so I learned a thing or two. Issei then asked, who was he? He was intrigued by the words of the dragon. You should have heard of him. His name was Francis Drake. Issei whined his eyes. El Drake? The one that fought against the Spanish fleet and was the sole reason why the Spanish didn't rule over the seas? He was read about it before. Where do you think he got his nickname? He was the past possessor of the boosted gear. That's why they named him like that. He was shocked at the new information the dragon told him. Now follow my instructions. Drake ordered his partner, making him stop his thoughts. Issei then placed his hands on the steering wheel. Thanks to Reed and Maru, being a magical ship, the controls of the ship could be changed into whatever he wished. However, because he has never driven anything in his life, he was taken off guard. Start the engine and turn the steering wheel. We are going ahead. Drake officially became the captain of the ship. A couple of hours later, the Persian Gulf. After almost crashing the ship twice, Issei started to get the hang of it. However, now the sun was high in the sky, and was already past the middle of it, so in few words, it was past midday. Isu was with a fishing rod he bought just before coming to the port. Erica had a book on her hands and was reading it while laying down on the couch at the side. Her smooth, skinny, skinny skin and beauty head while looking at the root was ridiculous, even for him to say. Fuki was sleeping on the other couch at his right, her pillow and her body curled like a cat. Whenever they didn't do something important, she would fall asleep, a lazy fox indeed. Since the journey will take a day, and according to Drake, he didn't need to always be at the steering wheel, he decided to try fishing. Azazel was fond of it, so it must be good. Issei had to agree that fishing was relaxing for now. He has only caught three middle-sized fish. They were going to be their dinner tonight. <sighs> Erica sighed. She was bored. Closing her book, she stood up from the couch and walked closer to Issei, moving her hips sensibly. 
Tell me something. I'm bored. I want to hear a story. Issa was taken with his guard down and almost dropped his fishing rod in the sea due to his surprise. Something? He asked back. Yeah, whatever is fine, she agreed, sat right at his side, waiting for him to start telling the story. She was close to him, less than an arm away. One of her legs were crossed on the top of the other, so her sexual appeal was obvious. She had her normal black bodysuit, but the armor on it was completely gone, leaving her pure white skin exposed, making Issei move his eyesight away from her long legs. I don't have something to talk about. You already know about pretty much everything, he told her, trying to calm down. Erica then asked, you said you were once a pervert. How did that work out for you? She was curious. Issa was surprised at her question, but he just smirked and thought, maybe this is a good way to start. He then answered, awful. How so, she asked. Well, looking at the sea, he started to explain, everyone treated me like trash. Now I know that my attitude was bad, but it still hurts being treated like that. Everyone treats you like filth. However, that was how I was. I wouldn't change how I was just to make some people I didn't even like approve of me. He shrugged his shoulders. Those were his words in a sense they were right. The woman was quiet, not interrupting him. I knew that my attitude at that point in time wasn't good, but I never crossed the line, he added while turning to look at her. Sure, I peeped at them, but that was it. When my friends tried to make me steal clothing, or even worse, I stopped peeping and distanced myself from them. Unfortunately, that was just recently. At the beginning of the year, I don't know why they wanted to steal clothing nor what they actually wanted to do with it but if things kept escalating like that sooner or later they would be doing something unforgivable he explained with a normal voice she was shocked at the words you mean those friends of yours wanted to do something else she asked a rather important question he nodded his head and replied yes why did you get close to those types of people she asked with a disgust at the mention of those guys you see Ever since I was small, aside from my parents and close friend I had, there was no one else. Because of that, I grew up to be desperate in search of clothes to in search to be close to others. And with ones that I'm close with, I treat them even better than myself. Maybe because I didn't want them to be away from me, explained to her. With those two, I valued that friendship we had even more than my life. That's why whenever they wanted to do something, and because I was afraid of no longer being friends with them, I followed after them just to fit into that group of ours. His words were shocking to say the least foolish now that i think about it but i realize that it's too late his tone sounded heavy his life ever since the war was certainly bad what about the supernatural world you told us you were once normal how did that change so she asked isei curious about his former life that was something neither fuki nor her knew about him isei looked onto her eyes and sighed he then talked about the past of his past the moment I first discovered about the supernatural world was by accident. See, a girl told me that she loved me and wanted to go out with me. Being the guy I was, I got far too excited. I thought about our future, Christmas, birthdays, college life forever, even marriage, just like a fool. Due to that, the fact that I was too open to everyone, I suffered, he explained with an emotionless voice, as if what happened was to someone else. The first date resulted to be a trap. She was sent with the purpose of killing me because of the sacred gear I possess. She purposely waited till the end of our date after it. Everything I cared for was ruthlessly destroyed. My feelings became squashed, a piece of meat on the ground. My mind was broken, and at that moment, when I actually opened to the first woman aside from my mother, he looked at Erica with cold eyes, obviously not directed at her. She looked into my eyes and stabbed me through my chest, saying horrible words to a heartbroken dying man at the side of a fountain. He turned his head away. After that, I was resurrected by a girl at my school. She resulted to be a devil, and I became her newest servant. The vampire was silently looking right at him. See, my my life as a servant wasn't bad. I learned many things, among them how to control my sacred gear. Later on, I became closer to Drake, and due to being someone that didn't think of him as a weapon, we became quite close, he smiled at the thought. Drake was also smiling inside the boosted gear. He was happy at those words. After months passed inside the parage, we became close, almost like a family. For me, this is the best outcome I could ever have and dreamt of. Beautiful woman at my side that didn't treat me like filth. A close friend that I could call my brother. A junior that idolized me as a role model. He smiled at those words and nostalgia air around him. Erica was silent, not daring saying another word. She just kept thinking about his words. Slowly, those women started to develop feelings for me. And as for me, well... You can't answer that on your own. He turned, faced her, and a beauty at his side. After that, he saw how Fuki stand up from the couch and walk by his side, sitting on the opposite side of the dragon and hugging his arm. She was awake ever since Erica asked him to tell her story. However, after hearing the first question, she continued laying down, frightening her sleep. 
but right now she stood up and went to his side, maybe as a sign of support for him to continue telling the story. Issei saw and understood what she was doing. He felt grateful towards her. He then looked at the fish and continued talking. They fell deeply in love with me. The pair of women already had their suspicions when he mentioned it before. But the how I actually confessed to the woman I loved the most was kind of forced. At some point, due to me having trauma with women, I was afraid of getting closer to them, fearful over the fact that they would do the same thing as the first woman I once loved did to me, he explained as he looked at the horizon. I created a mental barrier for me to not cross a line with a woman, but they didn't notice. When they started to seduce me, to make me cross a line and finally say those words, I couldn't. I was afraid and mentally refused the fact of them falling in love with me. Thanks to that, they exploded, reprimanding me for not understanding their feelings. The woman I loved the most was especially aggressive. She yelled at me, screamed at me, saying, Why couldn't I understand her? Issei was calmly explaining everything. The rest did notice how I couldn't understand her feelings, and because of that, they reprimanded me, saying, You're the worst! How awful could you be? Why don't you understand? Among others, both of the women were silent. Hearing this was certainly quite bad. They, as women, could understand them a little, but they explode to him like that? Sorry, but that was just wrong. Fugi was especially affected. She had extremely strong feelings for Issei, but she could see how he was carrying something with him, and when spending time with him, she also noticed how sometimes he was uncomfortable. Call it a woman's sixth sense. So because of that, she didn't push the matter. Instead, she waited and started to get closer to Issei, and it was working. Now she understood him a bit more. Not the entire story, but some part of it. Erika was looking at him the entire time. She felt something on her chest when she saw him like that. That something made her feel awful. Never would she have expected that he went through all of that due to some woman that they thought understood him when they didn't even notice something was wrong with him. Even her, that spent all of her life fighting in a war, noticed how Issa was sometimes acting weird. Now she understood why. After that, they left me alone to think, he quoted those words, about my mistakes. I spent some time thinking about talking to myself and just doing random things. At some point, I said something that made me remember that first woman I loved. However, they heard it from the other side of the door, since they were spying on me, and at that moment, they more or less understood what I was thinking. After some comforting and whatnot, we fixed our relationship, but they still told me I should apologize to Rias for how I felt. Unconsciously, Issei slipped and said the name of the woman. Both of them memorized it. Something about her made their blood boil. After many things, during a raiding game, I got too excited and screamed my feelings in front of everyone. Thanks to that, our relationship became better. Saying that she also loved me, and after some ups and downs, she finally became my girlfriend. That so-called woman I loved the most. End of the story. Issei told them half of what he experienced. The other half will come when he feels it's right. The women were silent, thinking over his words. Words. They were unsatisfied because they knew he was still keeping something, but just like until now, they will give it time. Yisei pulled his fishing rod, and with another fish, then he stood up, grabbed the bucket on the side, filled it with three fish, and then towards the control of the room of the boat. He never looked back, but he knew he felt how a weight was lifted from his shoulders. He knew that after some time, he would need to tell them what exactly he went through, but for now, he was happy as its progress. You did it, partner. I am happy for you. Soon you will let all of that in the past. At the moment, everything will change. I guarantee you, Drake told him with pride in his voice. Thanks, Drake. I'm slowly improving. Later on, I will finally leave all this in the past. He thanked the dragon and reached the steering wheel. Now, where to? He smiled and asked the captain of the ship. Ha! Huh. Turn right and keep holding the steering wheel a couple of minutes. We might arrive sooner than later. The wind is on our side. He was happy at those words, and did as mentioned. After that, the day went peacefully, some hours later. Seeing the coast of their possible destination, Issa yelled at Fuki, Cast an illusion on us so that nobody can see us. The fox nodded her head and used her abilities. A mist covered the boat, and the boat vanished from the waters. Navigating towards the coast, Issa was calmly driving the boat. The pair of women were at his sides prepared for anything. Thankfully, everything went through without a hitch. They reached the coast of the country. Seeing a rocky at the distance, Issei screamed at them, We need to fly over! It shouldn't take much to reach the solid land! 
They nodded at his words, Fuki with a flirty smile, as usual, and Erica with a smirk on her face. After telling them his story, the three of them felt closer to one another. Erica was smiling even more in his presence, and Fuki was trying to stick even closer to Issei was actually and Issei was actually letting her do it. Seeing their changes, Issei was satisfied. It seems that everything went better than he thought. On three, they nodded at his words. One, two, three. When he finished counting, they jumped high into the air. Issei dismissed his familiar, vanishing it from the sea. They flew over the dark sea and reached a small risk of what they thought to be the coast of Iran. All three of them landed perfectly without a single error. Then, they finally paid attention to the scenery of the new country they were at. After spending less than a day in the sea, night finally covered this part of the world. The sky was a perfect deep blue, shining with many stars that seemed to be closer than they actually were. The moon was right above them and appeared closer than ever before, just a finger away. Its perfect craters could be seen without a telescope. The view left the three of them without a breath. Not a single cloud covered the sky, so everything would be seen without much trouble. Isa was the first to look away, seeing how what was below them. A huge risk was below them. A small beach was seen at the bottom of the risk. Pointy rocks covered the vast majority of it, not a single trace of sand, just rocks. The sound of the winds crashing against the rocks was the only thing he could hear, and a sea breeze was the only thing he could smell. The horizon was covered with stars, making the sea shine with a mysterious light. Reaching his hand out, he pointed at the horizon. They had come all this way from there. A sense of accomplishment filled him. His pride was everywhere inside his body. How many have done what they just did? How many have the experience to tell? I crossed the entire Persian Gulf. He was sure that not many people were capable of this feat, and he was the only one of few that actually did it. This is only the beginning. Smiling, he turned around, looked at the woman at his side, both of them still looking at the night sky. We need to reach a town or a city. We have to sleep somewhere. His voice made the two women turn around and look at him. Understanding the indirect, Fuki decided to use the Yakasani no Magatama. They used the treasure only for this type of situations. Not for everything. Traveling all over the world with this was far too boring. It took away the emotion of traveling, so they only used it on special occasions or when it was needed like now. The familiar porter appeared in front of them. I made it so that it gets us to the capital. The normal voice of the fox was heard. Issa was suspicious of her words, but sighed and nodded his head. Walking through the portal, he was the first to leave the risk, quickly followed by the vampire and then the fox. Scene change, capital of Iran, Tenran. <clears throat> Appearing on the top of the oddly built tower, the three travelers came through the portal. Where are we? The fox was the first to ask. Issei ignored those words that were just to tease him and looked around. Fuki, where did you send us? The vampire asked the fox, who only shook her head, not knowing where they were at. Issei went close to the edge of the building and looked around. Below them, he saw a huge green plain with some people walking on it, seemingly looking around the place. He then found where they were. You have a talent in sending us in the most random locations, Fuki. He was impressed where they ended up. Issei, do you know where we are? Erika turned around and asked him. He only nodded with a smirk on his face. Yeah, I know where we are. He then turned around and looked at them. Welcome to Hazdad Tower in Tehran. Those were his words. After the information settled in, they quickly widened their eyes in shock. They were a rather famous place. During the boat trip, Issei informed them about special places here in Iran, and this was one of them. This tower was one of the few. It was an observation deck and also a museum which held underground part. The whole building was located at the Azadazi Square. This location was an incredibly important piece of the architecture for the Iranians. Let's go. We need to look for a place to stay, nodding at his words. The three of them started to look at the door, quickly finding it just behind them. After forcing it a little, it was opened. They walked quietly down the stair to avoid any suspicion and reached the bottom of the building. They soon opened the main door and went out of the square. The artificial light of the building in the square illuminated everything without a problem. Some humans were walking around the place, but because it was late at night, not many were seen. Crossing the entire square, they reached a small bridge that took them inside the city. All of this time was spent looking around and talking about random things amongst themselves, mainly about the country and its history. The city was really active during the night. Many restaurants were open and even some stores were here as well. Reaching at the end of the city, they found the hotel area. Seeing a rather beautiful building at the corner of the street, all of them got their interest piqued and walked closer to it. They couldn't read the words at the facade of the building, but they did understand a specific word, hotel. They looked at each other, nodded their heads, and went inside the place. Due to being late at night, the hotel obviously didn't accept it 
he guessed. But after some magic cast by Fuki, everything went smoothly. They had a huge single room for more than three people, but since it was the only one available, they had no other choice. They were guided by the bellman to their room, a small kid not even in his teens. Thanking him, they entered the big room. A huge hall with a big living room was filled with their view. That place was big and open at the bottom of the hall. There was a huge window that covered the entire wall. Two doors were the only thing aside from the living room, each one at the side of the hall. The whole place looked quite expensive, and thanks to the furniture, it actually was quite expensive. Our rooms are separated. Mine is on the left and yours is on the right. Have a good night. We'll talk tomorrow. For now, let's rest. Issei walked towards the left door and opened it. Walking inside, he then turned around and said, Good night. He even smiled at them. Erika just nodded her head at his words while Fuki smiled at him and said, Good night as well. Afterwards, they were both looking around the place they were currently were at, but Fuki, in Erika's eyes, was acting suspiciously. She seemed eager about something. She even had a weird smile on her face. Erika then turned the lights off and went towards her room. However, the fox did the opposite. She walked towards the room of Issei, grabbed the doorknob, and started to gently turn it. But before she could open it, a hand gripped her right shoulder. What are you doing? Erika asked while looking at the fox with a not too friendly look in her eyes. I'm going to sleep with Issei. That was her response. The vampire had a twitching eyebrow due to her answer. And why is that? She asked back. Because I want to be closer to him and nothing like sleeping together helps. Her words sounded logical? No, you won't. Erika didn't like the idea of her sleeping with Issei. Maybe even something else could happen. The thought of alone made her feel sick, really sick. Therefore, she decided to not let the fox sleep with them. You're coming with me, with a cold and serious voice, she said. Erika grabbed the resisting Fuki by the neck and dragged her to the room. No, she screamed as she tried to free herself, but it provided useless. Why are you not permitting me to sleep with Issei? Fuki yelled at Erika with a shocked voice. Because I don't like the idea of you sleeping with him. You might do something else. That was her response. Hearing this, Fuki was astounded. Never would have she thought that the vampire would say that don't tell me you also love you the question don't here let me repeat it don't tell me you also love Issei that question hit her like a hammer however she didn't answer instead she grabbed the fox with greater strength and threw her inside the room closing the door and ignoring the pleas of help she stayed outside that can't be true she shook her head refusing to believe Fuki's words her face had a decent blush and her thoughts started to spin quite the opposite from the normal Erica. I don't like... She stopped her thoughts and started to remember everything she went through with Issei. Her eyes held confusion and her face was bright red. Silence was her only answer. After being like that for some time, she gave up thinking about it. She then opened the door of her room and closed it, completely ignoring the thoughts she just had. Fuki saw her blushing and smiled. It seems her guess was right, even if the vampire denied it. Although she disliked the idea of another woman being with Issei, she needed help in making him open up. And since the vampire was starting to experience these feelings, there was a not a better companion to help her plan succeed. Hoo, hoo, hoo. It seems that Issa will fall earlier than I thought. She licked her lips, essentially. If the vampire allied herself with her, then everything will go twice as fast and half the effort. And although she didn't like the idea of sharing another woman, it was far better than that. I don't know why she said that twice. With those thoughts on her head, she laid down on her bed and covered herself and went to sleep. For now, she needed to get closer to him and help Erica out a little. With a mischievous smirk, the fox went to sleep. Some days later, slash the city center. The three of them were walking in the city center, the part of the any country that was the most interesting to be at. Seeing the stores at the sides and little business on the streets covering the part of the road, they looked around curiosity in their eyes. Ever since coming to Iran, they went to really common tourist attractions in some rather special places. They never thought that they could ski here. Seemingly, this place has pretty much everything. So after spending their time looking and messing around for a few days, they decided to go to the city center. A lot of people were seen everywhere, most of them humans, of course. Others were supernatural beings, but they just ignored them. As they continued walking, Issa was spotted something that took his attention. Walking close to a shop window, he saw something trapped at the other side of his and his interest peaked. He read it. Looking for personal looking for personnel for an excursion to the east of Iran. Suspicious possible ruins in the middle of an unexplored and dangerous jungle. Looking for volunteers. They need to have their own gear and enough courage. No pay will be given, but if anything is found, it will be distributed accordingly. After casting this translation spell, he say read the piece of paper. Such horrible conditions. No wonder they don't have enough people. He then turned back and looked at the shop in question. An old antique shop was his guess. No sign was on the shop's facade, but many things were inside of it. It. Seems interesting. He was thinking of going inside the store. Thanks 
Thinking for a few moments, he saw a pair of women come close to him. They were just on the other side of the road. What's up, Issei? Erida asked as she saw the store in front of him. Issei? Fuki asked as she looked at him. Sorry about that. I was thinking about this. Turning around, he pointed at the piece of paper on the window with his thumb. The woman got closer and read it as well. A curious look was present on Erika's face and Fuki's. There was a mysterious light in her eyes. The woman looked at each other and smirked. They grabbed Issei by both of his arms and dragged him inside the shop. He couldn't even say something before they crossed the entrance of the shop. Ding! The sound of the bell ringing echoed inside the store. After some seconds, steps were heard by in the room they were currently in. A middle-aged man, maybe around his early 30s, came to greet them. The man was not a normal human. They felt his presence of the sacred gear in him. He had long, black, messy hair that reached below his shoulders and a perfect chin beard. He had brown eyes that were filled with maturity and had a healthy tan skin. He was a head taller than Issei, maybe around six foot six. He wore worn military pants with brown combat boots and military tank tops, showing off his muscular arms. Issei finally freed himself from the grasp of the pair of the woman, ignoring the man. He looked around and saw the dusty shop they were currently in. The entire place was quite messy, having multiple things scattered across the floor, such as books, symmetrix, bases, and dust. A lot of dust. The walls were painted in a brown tone, and some bookcases could be seen against them. Weird tilted books not even Issei knew about were on the shelves, gathering dust. The most interesting things in the store were maps, pieces of armors, and some swords that emitted a magical aura, clearly not your normal piece of equipment. Who are you? The man spoke with pretty good English. Much to Issei's surprise, Issei stepped in front of him and looked into his eyes. With his cold and sharp voice, he talked. We got interested in the paper trapped on your window, so we came to ask about it. His voice was shocked. His voice shocked the old man, but he just nodded and said and said, follow me. Then he crossed the curtains at the bottom of the room, the three of them right behind him. After walking across the curtains, they reached another room. This one was far cleaner and more good looking. The place was small and aside from a round table, a couple of chairs and bookcases against the wall. There was nothing more. The man sat on the chair near the table and looked at them. Sit wherever you want. His voice was casual. Issei walked to the opposite side of the man and sat on the chair that was near him. The two women were behind him, looking at the things that were on the table with curious eyes. So you wish to become part of the expedition, the man asked as he lit a cigarette. Sounds interesting. That was Issei's reply. Interesting? You could lose your life, he tried to scare them off, but it didn't work in the slightest. And? What's your point? Hearing the response of Issei, the man looked at him with a fierce glare. Huh? He was stupefied. Possibly you won't come back from this journey. You will probably die even before reaching the location. I don't want to go with useless people that will. His words stopped as he felt something against his neck. Issei was still sitting on the chair, his feet on the table. However, Erika and Fuki were behind the man. The first were the nails against his throat and the second were a dense senjutsu hexagon pointed at his head ready to blow him into pieces at any moment. Okay, I understand that you don't want someone weak at your side for this. But don't think that it's too much for a simple test. He's explained as the man was sweating bullets. How about you tell us more about this expedition and then you'll decide if we are worthy of going or not. He then looked at the pair of women behind the man, silently communicating with only his eyes, telling them to come back. Erika scoffed and retrieved her hand, slowly walking towards Issei. Fuki got her senjutsu and did the same. The man was pale. Never has he felt so close to death before. You saw that we are no normal beings. We do know about the supernatural, so cut the crap and start explaining. I don't know you're no normal human, sacred gear possessor. He smirked just like the devil and, in a sense, threatened the man in front of him. The 30-year-old man was biting his lip. Never would he have thought these brats were actually monsters. Fine. He put out his cigarettes and grabbed a long parchment on the table. Extending it, it soon covered the whole table. This is a map that was found by my father many years ago. Disguises to some undiscovered ruins in the east part of the country. He pointed as he well elaborated map and said to them. Looking at the map, Isi was certainly surprised. It was really well made and extremely detailed. I wonder what this thing hides, he thought as he discreetly looked at the woman behind him. They were also surprised, more than another. My father didn't specify where he got it, but he did say the map guides you to the ruins of an ancient civilization. Ruins no one has ever heard about. Ruins that have many riches. The man was definitely excited. I'm looking for people that don't fear death. I have gone place to place, but before, the path is too dangerous. 
With many animals and plants that could kill human beings in the blink of an eye, he tried to scare them, but it proved inefficient. I have gone before, but even I almost didn't tell the tale. I have invested everything on the Slack's expedition in hopes of finally finding them. That's why I need capable people, he finished explaining. Issei was still stoic as ever. Hmm, that was his only answer. He turned around and looked at his team. What do you think? He asked his team. Sounds interesting. Besides, we already went to pretty much every place of our interest here, so why not? Erica was the one that answered. Fuki? He asked the other woman. No problem. Her flirty voice made him smirk. Drag? As his partner. No problem at all. That was his answer. Smiling, Issei turned around and looked at the man in question. It seems you just got three new companions. When do we part? He smiled at him in a threatening way. It was clear for all that no wasn't an answer. Fearful towards the young man, the owner of the store nodded his head. You're lucky. We are leaving tomorrow. Aside from us four, six more people amongst them, my son will come with us, he told the three of them. Where do we meet? He asked the man, satisfied with his response. Tomorrow at 5 a.m. sharp. Here is the shop. We'll part from here, and after a long car journey, we should reach the jungle in a day or so. He said nodded and lifted his feet on the table. Then he stood up and looked at the man. Understood, by the way, my name is Issei Hiodo. The woman behind me and Erica, the woman behind me are Erica and Fuki. A pleasure to being with you in this expedition, he smirked. That smile scared the man a little, but since they were going to be together during this, he needed to accustom himself to it. My name is Bellingham Misra. A pleasure. He extended his hand to perform a handshake. Issei nodded and completed his handshake. See you tomorrow. Baham, Issei turned around and walked out the room. The woman were following him. After leaving the room, and hearing the bell at the entrance ring, the man finally relaxed and fell into his chair. What are they? They don't feel like human beings at all. He m has met a couple of devils before, but aside from that, his contract with the supernatural was extremely small. He even knew that he had a sacred gear. That was no normal feat. Oh, Allah, please protect me and my son during this trip, he muttered as he lit another cigarette. Meanwhile, the team was walking in another city, talking about their new adventure. Whose ruins do you think they are, Issei? The vampire asked the cultured man. That I do not know. Many things have happened here in many eras, so it could be almost everything. Sumerians, Persians, Buddhism, I think even Christians, but of that I'm not sure. Those were Issei's guesses, but he wouldn't know unless they were there. Sounds intriguing, the fox told them. They had to agree with her words. It was certainly quite the mistake mystery. Indeed it is. Erica smirked at the satisfaction while Issei looked at him, a small smile adorning his face. I wonder what exactly is going to happen now, he thought to the three of them, got inside in the crowd of people. Tomorrow, early in the morning, slashed the meeting point. Father, who exactly is coming with us? A young man, maybe in his early 20s, asked the known as the one known as Beham. Baham. I'm sorry, I just wanted to say that. He was fit but not tall, and was a head smaller than his father. He had short, trimmed black hair and hazel eyes, making him stand out. He wore a short-sleeved black shirt, t-shirt, and his form-fitting dark blue cargo pants. Alongside them, he had a pair of construction boots, brown in color, and a yellow sole. Be patient, Jasper. They will come soon. It's not even late yet, the man crossed his arms and scolded his son. Exactly after his words, they saw a group of three coming towards them. All of the men, aside from Beham, that had a serious glint in their eyes were surprised. The group of three was guided by a really dangerous looking male. He had black eyes similar to an abyss that held a red tinge to them. His hair was dark brown in color, but it was far closer to black. His height was tall, maybe the second tallest man aside from Beham. His clothes were a gray coat and black shirt with black pants, completing his get-up with brown boots and reaching his knees. The six men sitting in the pair of, of jeeps were shocked, not by him, but rather his companions. The two most beautiful women they have ever seen were both at his sides. One had white hair and red eyes, giving off threatening vibe. The other had pitch black hair and also red eyes. Her entire being emitted a cautious feeling. They were both beautiful, and they were sure that just a smile from either of them could cause any man to fall in love. Sorry we're late. I thought we still had some time, he said, told Baham with a direct tone of voice. He just answered, Don't worry, it's not even 5am, so it's not late at all, he explained while walking close to them. 
I see. Then it's perfect. Issei was glad that he made it on time before anything else. The young man at the side of Baham spoke. My name is Jesper. Jesper Mizra. A pleasure to be with you ladies. He did a small reverence to the woman that only ignored him. Let's get going, Baham noticed the look in his son's eyes, so he decided to intervene before something went out of control. Everyone heard his words and started to get inside the jeeps. Preparing for the journey, Issei went to a jeep that was almost empty. Getting inside, he went towards the back part of the vehicle and sat on it. It seemed the jeep was a convertible, so it was quite comfortable. The girls ignored Jesper and sat at both sides of Issei. Before departing, Baham grabbed Jesper and took him to the side. Don't try anything with any of them. They are not normal at all, even for us to say. So do not piss any one of them off, especially the young man. He's dangerous. He advised his son, who only rolled his eyes as a response. Pfft. Don't worry, nothing will happen, now let's get going. He turned around and went to the jeep that had the woman in it. Oh, Allah, please help us in this journey. He went to his jeep that was only missing a driver and sat the driver's position. He was with his son and unfortunately with that young man. Vroom! He started the car and soon left, slowly being followed by another jeep. After leaving the city, the roads were completely empty, not even a car, aside from the pair of jeeps was near. The sincerity was beautiful. The scenery was beautiful, a concrete road that had some trees on both sides, mountains that could be seen in the distance, and clear blue skies were as empty from any cloud. The road was quiet and peaceful, though it only was before a certain young man started to talk. Issa had both of his eyes closed, leaning all the way over to his center seat, enjoying the breeze of the air that hit his head. Erica was calm, only holding, looking at the side, thinking who knows what. Fugi was trying her best not to move. She was leaning on Issa's shoulder, faking being asleep, but her small heaven was destroyed by a voice of someone. So what are you doing here, beautiful one like you? Yourselves coming with us seems intriguing. Don't take my words wrongly, I'm only curious. Jesper turned around and started a conversation. His words around Issei his words aroused Issei from his nap and made him move himself. Much to Fuki's displeasure, Erika just glanced at him and then looked back at the scenery again. No one answered, everyone was just ignoring him. Issei looking at the blue sky, Erika looking at the passing trees, and Fuki trying her best to lean her head on Issei's shoulder again. So what made you decide coming with us? Jasper didn't give up. So he decided to ask again. Sighing in defeat, Erika was the only one to answer with a voice full of thorns. None of your business, her voice was sharp, and made the smiling young man gain a drop of sweat on his cheek. I won't give up that easily, is that so? But we are going to be together for some time, so why not get to know each other better, he proposed, but the three of them ignored him again. I'll start, you already know my name, so I'll tell you something. I have a sacred gear, and a really good one. His words were filled with pride, but the pair of women ignored him. His father was so shocked, he almost lost control of the vehicle. That's not something you tell others. His thoughts were right. Telling someone about that was essentially paint a target on your back. Oh, seeing that the guy was too pitiful, Issei answered, but his response almost made the young man cough blood. It seemed he was just angering him. You dumb piece of swearing inside his head, Jesper was anchored. Then on his left arm, a red fingerless gauntlet appeared. Seeing the gauntlet, Issei was surprised and was also internally laughing. It seems that this thing is really common. Jesper, seeing the small light of surprise in Issei's eyes, smiled as if being superior. Ha! Huh, it seems you're surprised. Well, let me tell you, this is a rare sacred gear named Twice Critical. It's capable of doubling my entire strength for a specific amount of time. He was too proud for having something like that. Seeing the gauntlet, Fuki for the first time talked. Oh, the lower version of the boosted gear in a common sacred gear. Quite ironic seeing it here. The last words were directed towards a certain man at her side. Issei just ignored her words while trying to hold his laugh. Erica was also the same. Huh? Common? Certainly compared to the boosted gear, it's not much, but it's still powerful sacred gear. No, it's not. Both of the dragons thought. Seeing the mocking glare in Issei's eyes, Jasper was angered. What are you laughing at? You don't even have a sacred gear. You're just a normal human. His words this time made Issei angry. His left eyebrow was twitching. Sorry, what did you say? His tongue seemed to be filled with venom. Since he was a dragon, he hated being confused with someone else. Even if at first a human, he still didn't like being called like that. Let's say it brings back bad memories. This was slightly scared at his tone, but his ignorance is bliss. He wanted to impress the woman at his side, so he was too courageous. Benham thought, 
you dumb piece of shit. The first thing I tell you to do, and there you'd go and do it. He was cursing at him, but because he was driving, he couldn't grab his son and give him a beating. You heard me. A normal human shouldn't be making fun of something like this. You have no right, he say thought differently. I have a boosted gear that alone is sufficient to make you shut up. But you wish to impress both Fuki and Erica by insulting me. Do you think I'll let you do it? Drake agreed with his partner. Scare him a little, partner. He should be taught respect. Issei smiled at the dragon's words. Fine by me. He then prepared to mess with the human a little. You dare call me a human? Open your eyes, wide brat. I'm no human. He then released a bit of his aura and changed his eyes into that of a reptile. Both of the humans were shocked. Jesper at seeing those eyes and Behem at sensing the horrific aura. What the fuck is he? Those were Jesper's thoughts as he starred, stared at the man with shock. Oh shit. Allah, please tell me you're fucking with me. Behem, more knowledgeable, he read about a certain species a long time ago, thought to be the strongest, and also the proudest. You don't even recognize what I am? I'll give you a hint. To what species is related that sacred gear of yours? Behem was frightened at those words. He was right. The thing that was sitting right behind him was nothing less than a dragon. Son of a bitch, that was his response. Meanwhile, just was thinking, related to my sacred gear, the only thing related to my sacred gear is a dra- Widening his eyes at the realization, he felt a truck just hit him. You, you are a, a d dragon? He stampered in his response. It seems you do have a brain. Yes, I'm indeed a dragon. Looking into the eyes of the human, smiled. Issei had a big grin on his face. Jasper was left without words. Then he looked at the woman and asked, Then you, you, you are... He was interrupted by the words of Erica. No, we aren't dragons, he sighed in relief. But we aren't human, he swallowed his spit in shock. Then, he started and asked, I'm a vampire. Scaling her with her red eyes, Erica answered his question. Jasper just turned to look at the other beauty. I'm a yokai. Her voice carefree as if it was something common and normal. Jasper was astounded. He would have never thought that different creatures would be sitting right behind him. Beham was just driving. He decided to just ignore everything and look at the beautiful scenery. Wow, look, what a beautiful place filled with vegetation, animals, trees, and flowers. Nothing aside for big gray rocks were in front of him, so he was definitely in shock. Jesper turned around and sat in silence, not messing with anyone again. He was lost in his own thoughts and didn't pay attention to anyone else. The three of them smack, smirked and laughed discreetly. Smack! Erika and Issei did a high five while smiling at each other. Fuki just covered her laugh by leaning her head on Issei's shoulder. He smirked at her actions and creased her head a little, maybe to prove that she did an excellent job. Their plan, though it was spot, actually worked, and better than he thought. Scene change, jungle in Iran a day later. After the little experience in the car, no one dared talk. Due to that, the journey was really peaceful in the eyes of Issei, and now finally reached their destination. Getting down from the jeep, they saw a really deep and thick jungle. Tall trees putting some buildings back at the capital in shame. Could be seen anywhere. Vines were all over the place, and for the first time, different animal noises were heard. This is our destination. We need to go by foot from here on, Baham told all of the team. The rest just nodded. All of the men took different tools. Some of them matches to cut the vegetation down. Others took rifles and guns to protect themselves. But Baham just took a simple looking sword. However, Issei and the girls felt a rather particular aura that was emitting from the sword. A sacred gear that has a holy sword. Probably a replica of a famous one. Those were Issei's guesses. Let's go. We need to reach the ruins before nightfall. Baham was... Went at the front and started to guide. Jesper was right behind him with the map open, trying to guide them through the best route. The six men were just behind them, cautiously looking at the sides. Issei and the girls were far back, relaxing and enjoying the view. Sometimes they even talked about random stuff, laughing, enjoying among themselves, and not bothered by the jungle at all. They soon went deep inside the jungle, clearing the vegetation with whatever they had. They went further in. After less than three hours, they could only see thick plants and vines everywhere. Trees covered the majority of the sky, and humidity of the place was terrible. After walking through the jungle and seeing the rocks covered in moss, the spider webs carefully placed so that they caught something to eat. And many carnivorous animals, the humans began to get desperate. Walking through a dangerous jungle in such a bad climate with the terrible heat and humidity 
took a toll on their stamina. Actually, some of the men that came with them already gave up. Well, they were just normal humans. They couldn't be blamed. Thankfully, those guys got lucky and didn't die in the journey up until now, but the journey back was a different story. They wished them the best. Behem continued guiding them through the messy human jungle. Did... <laughs> Due to the heat Issei took from his coat, he took it off and kept it inside his personal dimension. Erika was his left at the side looking around the place. A bored look on her face, Fuki was walking in front of them acting as a guide. Issei, where do you think will we end up in? Erika talked to him as she was walking at his side. I don't know, but whatever it is, it is sure away from the civilization. Er Issei didn't know where or where they were at currently. Ha. <sighs> I hope anything will happen soon. Those are Erica's words. Seeing her like that, Issei rested a hand on her shoulder, making her look at him. Don't worry about it. My guess is that we will soon reach the place. Call it an instinct. Erica was grateful at his words. However, her mind played a slight trick on her and made her recall the night at the hotel and the words from Fuki. No, I don't think of him like that. Trying to hide her blush on her cheeks, Erica turned around and tried to keep it to herself. But she wouldn't stop thinking about every special moment she spent with him. From the moment they first met, to their training routines, to the words they talked during the night at Nusanu, to the explanation back at the Persian Gulf, to even the meaningless conversations they had ever since their first meeting. All of those made her experience a clash of feelings. A part of her liked the fact being with him, like until now, and another just wished to become even closer. After walking with those thoughts in her mind, they were forced to stop, but before Beham, Jesper, and Fuki were looking at a map, staring at it as if something was wrong. What's the problem? Issei asked them, while being cautious of his surroundings. About that. Beham was the first to talk. Sensing that something was wrong, Issei stepped closer and looked at the map. It looked really ancient, still made of animals, animals' leather. Drawn on it, there was a jungle alongside a couple of clues for them to notice as they were following the right path. At the bottom of the map, there was what he believed to be an entrance to the jungle. Following the red dotted line, they reached the first proof of them following the right path. It was a huge rock, but on its surface, a perfectly engraved eight-pointed star could be seen. They had seen the rock before. It was five meters in height, and engraving covered its entire surface, so it was kind of hard to miss. That was the first clue. They passed it hours ago. Following the path, there was the second clue, a tree trunk that crossed an entire waterfall, many vines that were drawn on and looked extremely detailed and well made. It was a bridge. They passed around an hour ago. Issei was guessing not wrong. The third clue was more special. It was actually a sculpture, or rather a natural rock transformation in the shape of something. It was a bull, or at least that was the general image it had. Apparently some rock formation had the shape of a bull's face and teeth alongside its eyes, and the stubbery of the mountain with a couple of flowers to form its fur. The dotted line then went down the bull and finally reached the final destination. It looked at the Temple of Ruins of One. That's when the problem presented itself. They hadn't seen the bull, but that was the least of their problems. In front of them, there was nothing. No more than a path to walk on. Just plain nothing. Shit, not again. Why does it always end like this? Always that stupid bull is the problem, Behan was screaming with a lot of anger and rage. They could understand him. After all, he should have spent a lot of time, resources, and effort coming here. The path was rough for any human, so coming here was not easy, and spending your own money alongside your time was... Just once, but many times, and, and never finding anything could be quite frustrating. Issei went closer to him and grabbed the map. He thought of something rather obvious. He then went to the edge of the cliff and peeked, but he didn't find anything at all. The trees below him were the only thing that filled his view. This shouldn't be right. There's something we're missing. He thought and looked around, thinking of a possible solution. The map was his only clue. Hmm. He searched all over for it, but he didn't find anything. Then Jesper angrily grabbed the map in his hands and yelled, Nothing? Absolutely nothing? This map is a farce! All of it is a farce! His emotions were made a mess, and his twice critical appeared on his left arm. All for nothing, he yelled, and a red aura surrounded him. It seemed his sacred gear was activated. Bam! In his fury, Jesper kicked a big rock, around the height of a tall human. The rock was sent flying and went down the risk. He said casually dodged it, since he was at the edge of the same cliff. Don't make a tantrum, he thought as he looked around and looked at the view of his cliff. Issei then stood there for some minutes, but then he noticed something that should have happened. 
Hmm, how tall is this risk? The rock should have already reached the ground by now. He peeked over the edge again and looked, but he didn't see a thing. Wait, his thoughts started to grin. Drake, what do you think about this? He needed a second opinion, so he asked his partner. Odd, if you ask me, that rock is big enough to actually make a mess when it lands, but there's nothing quite odd. Due to the mass of the rock, the initial force it was given was sent flying, plus the gravity it should have broken a few trees, and with that, a huge noise should have been heard, but neither of them happened. Hmm, you say started to think. What are you thinking, partner? Drake was quite curious. What if the ruins are non-man-made? What if someone else made them and hid them from the eyes of humans? His words managed to make Drake think deeply. It's possible. Ruins of supernatural beings, they aren't unheard of, but they're rather rare, even more so than the human world, he told his partner. There's only one way to figure it out. His words were loud enough to be heard by everyone, but before they could ask what he meant, Issei jumped off the cliff. Issei, the woman screamed when they saw that. They knew nothing would happen to him from his, this height, but seeing him jump off like that made their hearts race their throats. They ran at the edge, but they didn't see a thing. Nothing was present. Not seeing him made both of them feel something clogged in their throats. Now even their hearts seemed to stop for a moment. Issei, they screamed again, this time louder. Worry was a distant emotion in their voice. Just Bert and Bam thought, why did he jump? Is he suicidal? They were frozen at their spots and only thinking about the dragon. The four of them peeked over the risk that only saw more jungle below them, but aside from that, nothing could be seen. This weirded them out. After some seconds that felt like hours, all of them saw a black blur flying at impossible speed. It came from the bottom of the risk and reached their location almost instantly. I found it. Issa was floating right above their heads, and with a red and normal tone of voice, he told the four of them, So that's a dragon, Beham thought, as he saw those weird black wings that appeared on the floating above Issa's back. Jasper was silent, not really believing what was in front of him, and because of that, he was just silently staring at him with his eyes wide. Issei, what were you thinking? Erika screamed at him in frustration and anger. What were you thinking? You scared the life out of us. Weirdly enough, Fukis was scolding him. Seeing them like that, Issei smirked, angering the woman even more, but his thoughts were different. It seemed they were really worried about me. After I pulled that stunt, he was happy that they really cared for him, but before they could stop and scold him more, he spoke. If you wish to know why I did it, then come down. He crossed his arms against his chest and just looked out of them. Then he flew down. The four of them remaining people looked over the risk, but yet again saw nothing. Erika and Fuki looked at each other and nodded their heads. Fuki then created a senjutsu circle at the side of the risk, big enough for all to stand on. Afterwards, she looked at the two humans. Get over here. Her words were short, but the men soon walked closer and stood over the circle. Then, with all the people on board, the magic circle started to flow and slowly descended down the risk. The journey was slow, maybe because Fuki was being cautious about the location. While descending, the four of them looked around and found nothing in particular. Just a huge risk behind them and a lot of jungle in front. But some seconds later, those thoughts were gone. Bang! The Senjutsu Circle Fuki made hit something right below them, impending their movement. Erika was surprised, so while moving towards the edge of the circle, she peeked down below, trying to figure out what just happened. Looking around, she finally saw something. She tilted her head and watched it, what looked like some kind of ripple below her. It looked as if a drop of water fell towards a pond. After some thinking, she reached the conclusion, a barrier. Her roots made Fuki widen her eyes slightly while the two passengers seemed really confused. Fuki now understood they couldn't see anything below them. She was surprised that Issei figured this one out. Her dragon was quite smart. She then decided to increase the amount of her power on her spell. After pumping more energy into it, the many different engravings on it became much more visible. Even the Taijutsu symbol at the center seemed more vivid and lifelike. After some resistance, thanks to the barrier below them, the circle started to breach the transparent dome down below. After some thought, she discovered that his barrier was not built not only for hiding, but for something also to destroy, whatever came into contact with it. She then frowned and started to prepare something. Both of her hands started to glow with different lights, black for her left and white for her right. Many much sim smaller Senjutsu circles started to engrave her wrists, spinning constantly. She then slowly moved as if she was dancing, making the difference dances in less than 10 minutes. After that, she stopped moving her extended left hand and up to the right hand down. The light of both of her hands became dimmer and some seconds it was gone. Soon, they passed through the barrier and saw a different scenery than the one from before. They saw something they never expected to see. 
finally landing on the ground and dissipating the black and white sphere, all of present saw the one would call an ancient golden city. The entire location was golden in color as if it made it of pure gold, with only a few parts being black or white. Everything looked brand new as if the city was recently built. The orange sun was behind the whole city and gave it a vivid reddish glowish that made everything in front of them shine with an elegant light. And that is where we're going to be stopping for now. So I apologize for stopping. Well, I mean, actually, I just read for like another hour. I do these about every... I read for like about an hour every time. Thank you so much for the support. It's been absolutely amazing. Once again, if you guys would like to become a balance breaker or a limit breaker, just let me know and it will be in the description. Well, obviously, it still is in the description regardless, but it's also going to be on the premiere link as well. So thank you so much for the support, man. A lot of people keep asking me when the... Uh, IRL live stream is going to be when I say IRL it, it, I just mean uh, it's just me showing my face I'm still on the computer sitting my ass down so um yeah this time I will not be streaming with anybody else it's just me so uh I just thought that was worthy of mentioning so okay what do, what's go what's going on here with this live stream thing so I I'm thinking maybe around the 10th I'm, I'm going to have to do it before the 16th of August. If you guys don't know, I go back to school the August of 16th, and then I'll have some uploads scheduled. So, yeah. So, thank you so much for the support. Remember, the Ultra Instinct movie, almost finished, so I just need to do a little bit more things on it, and then I can finally post it. So, yeah. Thank you so much for the support, man. It's been absolutely amazing. Let's try to hit 1,000 likes. If you guys are still in this premiere as of right now, I know some of you drop off when I start talking, but if you go ahead and hit that like button, that'd be absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for the support, man. Seriously, I cannot thank you guys enough. Can't believe we hit 30K, man. We're on that 40K, 50K grind. And without further ado, remember... Uh, go subscribe to my two other channels at Popowski and uh, follow DXD down in the description below, as well as some other related channel section. And without further ado, Spartanic Arts DXD out.